Today we're going over the Binding Blade New Heroes banner in Fire Emblem Heroes. First time for newcomers will be Ogier and Elfin. We then have a double rearmed pairing of Lilina and the Book Fair Tempest side blog character, Diazzi. We'll go over everyone's stats and skills, plus discuss some general playstyle and build ideas. But before we get to the banner units, we have an instant demo thanks to Diazzi taking up a spot. Boris will be available in the 3 to 4 star demo pool, starting with this banner. Sadly, there are no free copies, so it's going to be on pure RNG to get them. Boris is also a Fey newcomer. It's been almost 8 years and we never got a Sword or Axe armor demote. That's going to continue because Boris is another Lance armor demote. For stats, Boris has 51 HP, 47 attack, 34 speed, 48 defense, and 25 res. He has the rare quadruple super boons for everything except speed. However, Boris also has the also common higher speed than necessary for many free to play armors come with. Unless you're planning to try a speed build, 34 speed is a bit awkward for the typical armor setups. It's not so bad for a physical tanking route because Boris still has really good physical bulk and solid base attack. If you want Boris to tank physical and magical damage though, then well, yeah, not great. For old skills, Boris has Ignis, Attack and Demon's Form, and Ventral Fighter. This is the first time Ventral Fighter is in the Demon unit, but we've had it on Ludwig and Halloween Kellum in the Grow Pool. Not the worst option for a budget build. Boris' new Inheritable Lance is the Double Lance Plus. Every turn if within two spaces of an ally grants plus six attack and defense to unit and those allies. If unit initiates or is near an ally, grant plus four dollar stats and bonus double four, aka take the highest field buff on the unit or from allies within two spaces and add that same amount in combat. Double Lance Plus is a new weapon, but it's the same effect as last year's Halloween Inheritables. Honestly, one of the better Inheritable options because it's literally just bonus double four with self and team buffing capabilities. If you can get speed and res buffs, that'll get the most value out of the weapon, and maybe you can actually utilize some of Boris' speed. Bonus double is vulnerable to buff neutralization, but the tier four effect also borrows from allies. This can still grant you part of the stats, although a team wide panic will curb that ability, so do be careful. For playstyle, Boris is a typical high physical bulk armor, so unless you want to get fancy with emblem rings, Saber is going to be the typical setup. Double Lance provides attack and defense field buffs for the team, which is nice, and Boris will double up in combat. If you want to do any kind of ambitious speed stuff, this weapon with maybe a bonus number status could be the way to go. Hey, if you can get res buffs, this is also one way to short Boris' resistance. New for armors are the tier 4 saviors. These enhance the armored specials by letting their 40% DR effect trigger twice. If the foe initiates at a special, armored blaze will grant 40% DR. If they follow up, basic attack or not, boys can get 40% DR again. In addition, twin save grants 7 HP on hit healing, which is great with Ventral Fighter's follow-up. If you upgrade to the tier 4, you can get a Bomb Denial and Bread type cooldown. This means boys can proc Ignis on his follow-up, but you can't get armored blaze on the first hit unless you get one cooldown. One way to do this is with Arcane Chiang, most of the effects of Ventral Fighter 4 though, so you may want another skill. Sadly, stuff like Reopening or Weaving Fighter don't really encourage follow-up attacks. The main use of Arcane Chiang though will be for Shield Fighter. You ideally want a one quit on defensive special. If you want to run Pavis, you need Slaying and Emblem Arts Ring, no compromises. Shield Fighter is incredibly strong since the only time you don't trigger defensive specials is on a fourth hit of a quad. A lot of strong Brave Attackers can push through though, so do be careful. For other skills, Boris just wants more attack and defense. More res can help against dragons or mages if you did want a far save. Wouldn't recommend that. For A skills, you can use Unity with Delver Lance or classics like the Close Defense 4. Earth Fire Boost or Stronghold are other good options. For Secret Seals, you can use Attack and Defense Form, Bond, or Squad Ace BT. Wily Fighter is Convert Quicker Post, and Mystic Boost can help against Adaptive Damage, which is becoming more and more common as an effect. For tuned skills, sadly it's pretty much just guard echo, not the best since armors have a lot of guard options. Overall, Boris is fine with physical damage tanking and he might actually be able to use his speed for something like frozen, don't count him out. This will come at the cost of resistance, most near saviors don't focus on magical tanking as much since it's just dragons and adaptive damage can be stopped with a mystic boost. He's not going to outdo the fire stars of course and he's going to be kind of tough to merge but you know Boris should be okay as far as demon armors go. Onto the actual banner units, Ogier is the 4 star focus unit, he's available at 4 fire star ready and he's going to demo to 3 to 4 star pull after the banner is over. Ogier would be the latest free to play swordmaster trying to make a name for himself. For stats, Ogier has 46 HP, 44 attack, 47 speed, 36 defense and 24 res, attack and speed super boons. OJ has pretty high base HP but also very good base speed, he will be our first gen 9 free to play sword infantry. For old skills, OJ has Luna and an unusual speed and res ideal 3. 
He then brings dodge into the demon pool with close call 3. We've had repel in the heroic grail pool, but perhaps you prefer the hit and run aspect of close call instead. The tier 4 is on female lair and fallen female violet. Nice little surprise from Ogier, maybe a sign of things to come because boy of dodge skill is kind of fallen from grace. For his unheadable weapon, Ogier has the Deadler Sword Plus, same exact thing as Boris' Deadler Lance but in sword form, plus 6 attack and defense field plus to nearby allies with bonus Deadler 4. We actually already have this weapon in the game in Halloween Callum's Farmer's Tool Plus. If you like funny weapons, the Farmer's Tool is just a rake. Don't ask me why a rake is considered a sword. In terms of playstyle, dodge has been a little iffy, however you can find something like Scowl. Ogier could use the regular percent DR to take basic attacks, maybe try to pair with Temple and Guard to further stop specials. You can't really do much against partial DR piercing though. Now if you want to use Close Call, it might be interesting now that we have some stronger initiation skills like Excel and Endless Tempest or just Mr. Sigurd's Ring. Close Call's hit and run effect can act like a pseudo console to retreat. You might be able to use this with like fortifications to set up stone terrain, but I don't know if that's worth it. Now in terms of weapons, the Deadly Sword is honestly one of the better options. Units without unique weapons need all the stats they can get, so even though a low effect can stymie the bonus Deadly part, I think it's worth the risk. Luckily, Deadly Sword and Distant Bonus Deadly both borrow field buffs from nearby allies. You're going to lose 6 points of the stat for the extra field buff, but you can still get the plus 12 in combat. The Sacred Seal Bonus Deadly 3 isn't going to be able to do this though. Regardless, Deadly Sword buffs teammates to borrow from, and Odds Be Way 4 does the same. Now Ogier can give 3 field buffs to the team, he gets no follow up for himself, and you can stack in combat buffs with multiple bonus Deadly skills. This setup can then be used with Lagoo's friend, since there's no sling, Ogier can run Gust, and it gets gonna get tear on piercing now. The main downside is that you ideally want 2 cooldown gusts so it precharges before you get hit, so you can get the 40% DR. Times Pulse Echo can solve this, or you can outsource now uh, Odd Speed Wave 4 to other allies and then just use Times Pulse 4. If you prefer Gonic Reflexes, you will need Arcane Devour. We could very easily get a third Arcane Sword soon, so inherit at your own risk. Devour's Sling lets Gonic Reflexes work with Lagoo's friend, and you know, Fall Up Befark is super nice to free up other skills. Speaking of which, Devour would be better for our Close Call Tempest example. The Slang and Breath Tide really help proc no quarter gust. You can run Temple as a seal too. For other skills, Ogier can make use of the typical Swordmaster stuff, dodge, potent, tier 4 enough fallup or tempo, finish 4 with times pulse or pledge type cooldown. With this high base HP, you can use image pulse 4 instead of times pulse to add another support aspect. A tier 4 boost skill and squad a sacred skill can tack on even more HP to work with. If you want a no fallup sword, we do have a couple of those, the no sword or the pedophile blade plus. For a non 5 star sword entry, Ogier is in a fine spot stat wise to make use of any of the generic builds. He's got good speed to work with and he focuses on defense more than res which is fairly typical. Infantry always get a lot of fun new stuff to play with so Ogier should be fine if you want a merch project. Our only permanent 5 star addition for this banner is Elfin. He is a bard but I'll just be calling him a dancer for simplicity. Elfin is a colorless infantry mage. For stats he has 37 HP, 20 attack, 47 speed, 20 defense and 46 res. It's been a hot minute since we've had a pretty meme stat line, but Elfin knows what his job is, and attacking ain't it. Elfin ties with Merlinus for the lowest base attack in the game, and will have the absolute lowest with Dragonflyers included. His base HP and defense isn't amazing, but Elfin will be super fast, and he has a solid 46 res with a super boom. For old skills, Elfin has play to refresh allies. He then has infantry no follow 4. We just got the tier 3 from Dorothea in the demo pool. She can actually take on Elfin's entire kit since he has a dancer B skill. Now Elfin comes with the Light of Etruria, 14 might tell, every player or enemy phase, Elfin grants plus 6 speed and res and hexblade to himself and allies within 2 spaces. At the same time, if foes within 3 rows or 3 columns do not have more than 5 res than Elfin, he inflicts minus 7 attack and speed, the guard status and the exposure status onto those enemies. Elfin will get a flat plus 3 res to help with his check. If the foe initiates combat, Elfin inflicts attack and speed debuffs equal to 6 plus 20% of his flat res. He also gets a miracle effect. Elfin's buffing happens on both phases, meaning he can buff up different allies based on your positioning. This also lets Elfin avoid certain status neutralization that occurs at start of enemy phase, since those are not going to affect buffs triggering at the same time. For his own debuffs, Elfin has a built-in attack and speed ploy 3. He will replace the actual ploy status though with a guard status. Now in terms of combat, Light of Etruria is only active on the enemy phase and is purely for survivability. Attack and speed debuffs with Miracle. If 20 base attack wasn't a hint, you can't even initiate with this tone. Now for his inheritable B skill, Elfin brings us the second tier 4 cantrip. This one is attack and res cantrip 3. 
if Singer Dance is used, inflict minus 7 attack and res, and sabotage on foes in current directions of both the user and the ally. The tier 4 cantrip was only ever on a Tomb to Zero so far. Sabotage is going to double down on the attack and res debuff parts, assuming you can line up with the enemy. With how some units cleanse penalties, this can be a nice option for mid-phase debuffing. Generally, you want to initiate after using this ability. If you wait to the enemy phase, it might just get cleansed away. Now, Elfin's a fun support unit. A dancer with built-in Miracle is hilarious, though you can't use Elfin to attack because Miracle's not going to activate. Miracle aside, Elfin has great speed and res and buffs both for his team. He inflicts attack and speed debuffs, and Light of Etruria inflicts attack and speed in combat. This gives Elfin a decent chance to survive, and he has infantry no follow 4. If you can't outspeed him, you ain't killing him without brave hits. Now, infantry no follow also provides warping so Elfin can hop around to dance. For team support, you got an unfollow up status, a hexblade status, and then potentially the cantrip uh, sabotage. You can add a buffing slash debuffing sacred seal, or you could use phantom res just to make sure Elfin hits his ploy debuffs. You could use Wings of Mercy in the B slot, or as an attuned skill. You could use attack oath for warping if you want another C skill, maybe something like counter control. In the B slot, we got the dancer buffing B skills like Firestorm Dance, that may be better than cantrip if you don't need the debuffs. Now for funsies, what else can Elfin use? Because he has Miracle, you may want healing to re-trigger it in another fight. Finish skills grant healing on hits, but Elfin needs to charge a special. A dainty Moomba or Noontime would be fine. If you want to get double Miracle, you could use something like Pledge for Breath to Cooldown, or you could spend arguably way too much on Pulse Up, since that grants minus one cooldown every single turn. The Goose Friend is another expensive option. Minus two instant cooldown and flat DR to add to Elfin's attack debuffs. For even more premium skills, you could run Flare. The good part is that Flare heals 30% max HP because Elfin's dealing no damage. Now for other annoying skills, Percent DR is obviously good to stay alive. Guard 4, Guard Echo, Nelsie Disrupt. In the A slot, Stronghold is the best for fire resistance, or you could just do a boost skill for HP. All in all, Elfin is pretty cool. Instead of just some combat abilities, he's gonna go for Miracle. Sadly, Miracle can't activate on the player phase, so you can't do something cheesy like triggering Wings of Mercy by suiciding in first. This will possibly make him a little tough to use on a defense team, although the enemy AI might not attack because Elfin has such low damage. That's kind of big brain. Our first new rearmed hero is Lilina. She's dressed in red still, but Lilina is now a green infantry mage. For stats, she has 40 HP, 48 attack, 35 speed, 70 defense, and 40 resistance. Attack super boon, very good at base attack and res, and some speed that might be useful. Stay away from physical hits, although Lilina has some defensive perks this time. For old skills, Lilina has a cut assist strike and attack and res ploy 3. Both of these fit well into Lilina's high burst playstyle while being able to help out the team. Lilina will then bring the Arcane Truthfire Green Tome, second arcane option for the Green Mages. Every turn, they have above 25% HP, Truthfire grants plus 6 attack field buffs, and the regular warping status to the user. It has accelerated specials. If unit initiates with more than 25% HP and uses an aerial effect special, you get minus 1 instant cooldown before the AoE triggers. This can then proc the AoE if it's charged. Now, in combat, you get bonus stats equal to 25% of the foe's attack, minus 4. The foe needs 72 flat attack for the max plus 14 to all stats. In addition, you deal true damage equal to 15% attack, and this applies to AoE specials. You get 7 flat DR for first attacks with an S, and finally, if you're not using an AoE, you still get the minus 1 instant quinon before your first attack. Truthfire is almost identical to Arcane Blood Gang. The main difference is a lack of no guard, but in exchange, you get instant quinon for AoEs, a plus 6 attack field buff, and then the warp status. For general use, Truthfire offers a good amount of stats, true damage, some flat DR, and then the slank plus instant cooldown combo. However, if you know Lilina, this thing is geared toward AoE burst. Truthfire's cooldown is enough for this Lilina, but for other AoE mages, you're gonna need to find two more cooldown effects. Real quick, a side by side of the two arcane green tomes, Truthfire is a lot more potent with it most likely granting double the amount of stats as Caliburnus, plus you need extra cooldown with true damage. 7 flat DR isn't bad either. Now Caliburnus is good if you really need a follow up, though it's far from guaranteed. If you do follow up, you can get the breath type cooldown to proc a big special, and then low attack and res is still pretty good to have. Caliburnus is okay, but Truthfire grants some things tough to come by for a mage like the instant cooldown and flat DR. The warping is also quite good. Ironically, Rearm Sonya vastly prefers Truthfire because she's an AoE mage. Her A skill grants the two cooldown needed for a one turn AoE proc, and she has no guard plus gains minus one cooldown each turn after to recharge later. 
Now, like her previous ults, Lilina also has a unique AoE special, and it's a 2 cooldown version. This one is called Gift for Magic. It has the same range as Gifted Magic, which is to say it's the common Blazing Wind, 1 adjacent uh, tile splash. For damage, it's simply Lilina's attack minus the foe's flat res. Tied to this special is the Hardy Bang effect. This protects Lilina from Vantage. New to the kit, if Gift or Magic procs, she will gain 50% tear piercing in combat. Additionally, if any special is ready or has triggered in the current fight, like this one, Lilina gets 40% unpierceable DR for the next attack. Gift for Magic being too cool now means Lilina always charges it when initiating. I don't think anything can currently stop this. Now you can reduce the AoE damage with various percent DR skills. If that happens, Lilina's DR piercing is for in combat only to help finish the job. While well, she has her Vantage Protection, if she really needs to get dirty, she now has 40% damage reduction. Add on Arcane Truthfire's bonus defense res plus flat DR, and it's a decent amount of bulk for a AoE Mage. Keep in mind, the 40% DR can trigger on enemy phase as long as someone special is ready. The 50% DR piercing though is player phase only, because you have to trigger gift for magic. If you were here for the Ninja Banner, you should recognize Lilina's new Slime Mirror. This is the attack and res version of the newest player phase skills. If initiating, gain plus 8 attack and plus 10 resistance. Unit gets a free follow up attack, and if the user has 2 positive statuses or the foe has 2 negative statuses, you get plus 5 true damage, and that also applies to AoEs. Slime Mirror comes from Mirror Strike 2. Lilina can use the free follow up to cancel a follow up denial since her speed with Arcane Troop Fire isn't that bad. As for the true damage, you can get more value from, say, Crystalline Water, but Gift of Magic doesn't have the 1.5 times damage multiplier that Blazing Specials do. With that being said, you need either two statuses for Lilina, or you need to inflict two statuses on the foe. Attack and res ploy should cover that. Ironically, with ploy, you usually want more flat resistance, so crystalline water may still be preferred, plus it also protects from panic and debuffs, plus it helps for enemy phase. Now, rearm Lilina will bring the pain with her AoE gift of magic. She will sacrifice damage compared to the regular blazing AoEs, but the trade-off is that Lilina always has gift of magic ready to go. To try and add to the damage part, Truth Fire gives plus 6 attack with attack scaling true damage, Slime Mirror adds 5 true damage, and Attack and Resploit lowers enemy resistance while inflicting exposure for another 10 true damage. To finish the kill, Lilina has 50% DR piercing in combat with a call to strike instant damage and more true damage. She has Warpman to move around, though that has no cons at this time. Instead, Gift of Magic gives 40% damage reduction, and Truth Fire adds some bulk. You got Deployed Deboss, and then you could run other percent DR skills to stack with, like Fleeting Echo. Interestingly, Gift for Magic's percent DR works on enemy phase and against melee foes. The issue is that it has to be charged, which Arcane Truth Fire only will do if Lilina attacks. It's possible Gift for Magic recharges in combat while Lilina basic attacks. That could mean she does have the 40% DR for the next enemy phase fight. Now with her base kit, Lena's A and B skills are player phase only, Crystalline Water would give attack and rest for either phase while helping deploy rush check and adding to the AoE damage. I think it's a fair alternative. In the B slot, Speed and Rest Discord is another debuffing skill, but it also inflicts in combat debuffs and true damage based on resistance. Occultist Strike is okay, but one issue for AoE specials is Breath of Life. That also counters the 7 instant damage. Speed and Rest Discord could be a replacement for this, although you could also just run Temple 4 or Magic No Follow. Speaking of Breath of Life, Fatal Smoke 4 can cut down on the healing. For other skills, Squatty's BU can boost flat res and attack with plus 5 HP, and you're not going to dump defense more. Stillwater can be a higher flat attack and res option. For initiating, Desperation 4 can actually work with Slime Mirror's follow-up now. Lilina can also use the Warping of Truth Fire to activate the 2 movement condition. Now if you want Lilina to trade with dragons, you're going to have to bring Mystic Boost. In conclusion, Rearmed Lilina brings her AoE special talents and tries to solve the issue with AoE counters by having damage in combat. She brings unpierceable percent DR and a follow up to try and tank a hit, then double if the foe still isn't dead. I'm not sure if it's enough to brute force and overpower the AoE counters like the new Nagi, but Lilina isn't going to totally roll over if she does get hit. Our last unit for today is Rearm Diazzi. Our latest Tempest Trials boss is an Axe Armored unit. For stats, she has 49 HP, 50 attack, 18 speed, 47 defense, and 42 resistance. Attack number is Super Boons, fairly mid maxed armor. Diazzi will tie for highest base attack in the game, although I believe she's the first to actually just have 50 attack without Dragon Flowers. For Diazzi, HP is a little important for her personal skill, and HP Boon wouldn't hurt to have. For old skills, Diazzi has Valentine's Ephraim setup. Armored Blaze and Earthfire Boost 3. Spoilers, she also has the tier 4 attack and defense near save. 
Now we got a peek at the Arcane Giant Axe earlier, though I'm going to go through it again. This is the third Arcane Axe. At start of either phase, neutralize Panic and Attack and Demon's Debos being applied at the time. This weapon has Slaying. If foe initiates combat or has more than 25% HP, you get bonus stats equal to 25% of the foe's attack, minus 4. Same for Arcane True Fire. The foe needs 72 flat attack for the max plus 14 to all stats. In addition, Giant Axe deals true damage equal to 15% attack and gets flat damage reduction equal to the same amount. Both of these will work for AoE specials. Last, Giant Axe gets minus one instant cooldown before the user's first attack. Slaying plus the instant cooldown is the hot new trend for arcane weapons. They also now grant plus 14 to all stats potentially. Giant Axe will want high attack users for true damage and flat DR. Generally not an issue for many Axe fighters. We don't have a solid ground four upgrade, but Giant Axe has the effect that it would have had. Panic would attack a debuff, debuff neutralization at the start of the turn. This is good to keep your stats consistent. Now, while Fiatsi can use them, Giant Axe will be fun under instant cooldown skills such as Momentum or Lagoo's Friend. With Momentum, you could possibly trigger Ignis instantly, and for Lagoo's Friend, this can help offset scale effects. Rally Spectrum or Thor's new Worldbreaker are other methods you can use to abuse the instant cooldown. Funny enough, Giant Axe's debuff neutralization directly counters Arcane Threema's debuffs. While Threema only grants plus 5 stats at base, it has a built-in sabotage effect to possibly catch up in stat advantages. We then split off into pretty different effects. Instant Quinnon versus Tempo, Giant Axe is about hitting harder and taking less damage, while Threema is the premier speedy axe option with no follow-up. As for the first Arcane Axe, Arcane Downfall prevents a follow-up attack, which, to be honest, can be powerful if people don't respect it. It has Breath Type cooldown, which isn't bad, and then 7 HP healing on hit. It's actually hilarious that the weapon type that is generally filled with slower units still doesn't have a free follow-up Arcane weapon. Giant Axe can work for slower, fast units, but 3 much generally better if you need no follow-up to guarantee a no follow-up skill shenanigans. Moving on, the Hatsi will begin a unique B skill called Brutal Velocity. She's a Jotun, so she does have Pathfinder. Every turn and after she acts, the Hatsi inflicts minus 7 attack and defense and gravity on foes in current directions if her max HP is higher than the foe's current HP. If the foe initiates or is healthy, the Hatsi inflicts attack and defense devils based on how much higher her max HP is than the foe's current HP. The Hatsi needs 13 or more HP to inflict a max minus 18 attack and defense. In addition, she gets a free fall up, no guard, and then 50% DR piercing for every attack. Brutal Ferocity is interesting because Thiatsi drags mobile units down to her one movement level. If you're not careful, Thiatsi can open up attack routes with Pathfinder while you're trapped with one movement. This may not be as effective if she's hiding in the back, but you could bring Guidance type warping to ferry Thiatsi forward. For combat, Thiatsi wants pretty high HP. The more HP she has over the enemy, the more debuffs she inflicts. The no guard effect is great with Giant Axe's other cooldown perks. The 50% DR piercing will make Thiatsi's hit sting, plus the free fall up is good if foes can't stop it. Last new skill from Thiatsi is Attack and Defense Twin Near Save, Tier 4 Attack and Defense Near Save skill. If you missed out on Trick or Trading, Tier 4 Saviors still have the same base effects. The new additions are the 7 HP on hit healing, and then you use a special with Unpierced Percent DR that only triggers once per combat. This skill will let it trigger twice per combat. Emblem Ike isn't going to count. Tier 4 saviors are targeted at the armor type specials such as Armored Blaze or Beacon. This doesn't increase the tankiness of the unit for a single hit, but if they get hit multiple times then it can help. For Hardy or Shield Fighter builds, this effect is useless, but the on-hit healing is still fantastic, just more bulk enemies need to chew through. In terms of playstyle, Gatsi is generally just another near savior armor. She has the new tier 4 savior to activate Armored Blaze's percent DR twice, and Arcane Giant Axe grants flat damage reduction to combo with it. Twin save also heals on it. Now when taking a hit, Brutal Ferocity is no guard, but the Giant Axe's sling and instant cooldown means Armored Blaze is ready to retaliate with on the counter. It has 50% DR piercing. Stat-wise, the Atsi does get some speed thanks to Giant Axe, and that actually could help her with free follow-ups from her B skill. She may double other super slow units. Now if the Atsi wants to stack HP since her gravity and attack and defense deals require an HP comparison. With the Arcane Weapon Stat Refine, Earthfire Boost, and a Squad A Seal, that's an extra 15 HP. Besides the usual near saving stuff, the Atsi can cause some chaos with Pathfinder and her long range gravity. A counter control ally would be pretty annoying to pair with, and some guidance warping would be very fun. For other skills, the Atsi is a near savior, but you could do far save if you wanted. You're gonna need distant counter. A hardier short fighter build would be fine, but that's not gonna make the Atsi any different than any other axe armor with giant axe. Brutal Ferocity is a more aggressive skill. 
Hardy Bang can be nice to stop Desperation, so Deoxy gets her turn to attack back. You could try some player phase tactics, stuff like Assault Troop or Armored Boots would make Pathfinder easier to manage, and let Deoxy move farther to Gravity Foes in certain lanes. It's not Bulwark, but maybe the Abstract Sacred Seal could find a use here too. As for attune skills, it's pretty much just Guard Echo again for armors. With that said, Wings of Mercy Echo could be a bit spicy. If you can get Deoxy one more cooldown, she would be able to proc Armored Blades on initiation. Emblem Marth is one way to get this going. The Warping could also do some wacky Pathfinder stuff. Overall, Deoxy might find a unique place among the many savior armors with her mobility. Her B skill is pretty good, but I'm not sure it's enough to make an offensive savior a worthwhile role. The DR Piercing is something other armors lack, but it's also just tough to beat Shield Fighter when it comes to protecting your team. That's all I got for this video. Good luck on your summons because we got a whole lot of banners incoming for the holidays. If you don't plan to summon, our next Grand Hero Battle Unit is Zeiss. We'll see what our first Gen 9 free to play Lance Flyer has to offer. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.